Okay, welcome to this new series that we're doing on uh, Marxist philosophy. And the way this is going to work is it's going to be a series of talks about 15, 20 minutes long throughout the weeks, which will go through all of the key aspects of uh, Marxist philosophy, the different key concepts, the different logical ideas and the arguments to back up uh, Marxist philosophy. And if you watch all of these videos, you should come away with quite a good understanding of Marxist philosophy as a whole and how we use it to explain the world around us. Now, why do we discuss philosophy as Marxists? Some people find this to be a bit of a luxury and shouldn't we instead be going out onto the streets and campaigning for high wages or, you know, fighting with fascists or something like that? Well, obviously we do those things as well. The, the two are not mutually exclusive. Um, but it is essential to be absolutely clear about our philosophical ideas because we're fighting to change the world fundamentally, not just to improve things a bit, to end this or that problem, but to liberate humanity ultimately from inequality, injustice, oppression, etc. And that requires that our worldview is as uh, thorough, as deep, as thorough, as realistic, if you like, uh, and as long term as possible. So not a view which is sort of seduced by short term, you know, solutions, by prejudices or anything else, like any kind of illusion, basically. Um, and uh, our goals are far more ambitious than, you know, uh, any other political movement uh, in history, really. So therefore, of course, we need to have, and everyone has a philosophy, uh, 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 not least any political movement obviously has a philosophy and we have to be absolutely clear about what ours is. So today's session is just going to be an introduction and especially going to be focusing on materialism, uh, which we'll also go into in more detail next week. Um, but uh, yeah, so Marxism is a materialist philosophy, thoroughly materialist, unambiguously materialist. Um, and that means that we think that matter exists independently of the mind. OK, so there's there is only one reality, and that is the material reality, which, of course, many people accept uh, in one form or another, and in most people's daily life, obviously, that's the assumption. But for us, this means that there is no other reality. There is no world, no spiritual realm. You know, there is no God or anything like that. And it also means that for us, um, not only is the mind dependent on the material world, if you like, uh, but also that the material world is not dependent on the mind. And that's important to state. Uh, in other words, the material world existed prior to the existence of thinking beings, in other words, humans, uh, which again seems obvious to state. And yet in philosophy, this is not necessarily the most predominant view. Uh, in fact, I would say that in the history of philosophy, the most prevailing outlook is idealism, which is the opposite of materialism. And that is the outlook essentially that um, in one way or another, because there's many kinds of idealism. But that, that is the outlook that um, ideas or th thoughts are somehow independent of material reality, or at the very least that material reality cannot be independent of thought. So perception almost makes the world, essentially. Without perception, without something to perceive the world, the world could not exist. And one sort of cliched and very famous um, example of this is the, the question of whether or not if a tree falls over in the woods and nobody is there to hear it, does it really make a sound? Well, a Marxist, a materialist would answer unequivocally, yes, of course it makes a sound. Um, it just means that nobody happens to experience that sound. It still, of course, happens. If that sound didn't happen, then how on earth could somebody uh, experience it if they were there? Um, and so, yeah, idealism is actually really the dominant philosophy uh, in the history of philosophy. As, as I said, there's many kinds of it. And that might seem weird. Like it's, it's, you know, it seems obvious that the material world exists independently of us. So why is idealism in its various forms so, so uh, predominant? I would just say there's really two main uh, reasons for this. The first, I think, is the, the abstract character of thought itself. What is it to think? Well, to think is really to generalize and to make abstractions. So if you have uh, an idea of something, um, then that means that you have generalized it. So if you have the idea of a chair, that means, of course, that you're not beholden to this particular chair in front of you, but that the idea of it kind of is, 
embraces all chairs. And, and that's what it is to have an idea of it being a chair. Otherwise, it's just uh, an in, a purely individual object that happens to be in front of you. That's what thinking is. It's generalization and it's an abstraction, if you like, which is an enormously powerful thing, of course. But there is a, a kind of a danger of this, uh, which is that through um, abstracting and generalizing, the abstraction can come to seem almost independent of or even greater than the thing that it is abstracting from. Uh, in other words, you know, our ideas such as a, the idea of a circle seems almost more perfect and for some philosophers more true than the imperfect circles that we actually find in the material world. Um, and I would say the other reason uh, for the predominance of idealism uh, is the existence of class society and exploitation inequality. Once you have class society, there is a layer of society, a privileged layer, that doesn't have to work physically. Uh, in fact, it doesn't necessarily have to work at all. It lives off the work of others. Um, you know, this layer of, of, of the, if you like, the leisure class, the ruling class, that is, of course, deals more in ideas and is more highly educated uh, throughout history. And therefore, it's natural, if you like, uh, that such a class would justify its existence by elevating ideas, the world of ideas, above that of, you know, the grubby world, the dirty and imperfect world of manual labour, you know, and generally the struggle uh, for survival. And so the outlook of professional philosophers um, throughout history has tended to have this kind of elitism, if you like, and I think that is expressed uh, in idealism. Now, materialism was not discovered for the first time by Marx and Engels. Uh, there were many materialists before them. The first philosophers, in fact, were uh, materialists. The first ancient Greek philosophers, um, that is, people who specifically dedicated themselves to, to, the, to philosophy, such as Thales or Anaximander or um, Heraclitus. These people were essentially materialists. They attempted to explain the world um, only through the world itself, uh, through natural forces alone. They didn't resort to spiritual forces or gods uh, in any way. It doesn't it, Of course, their ideas today in some respects are very outdated, although in, in many respects they are extraordinarily ahead of their time with some brilliant insights. Um, and this reflected, this layer of philosophers, I think, reflected the development of ancient Greek society at the time and the, um, the development of commerce, basically. And, and you had a class that was a very worldly class dealing in, in mathematics and, you know, developing the world and with, with a, a sort of high, highly educated, essentially. And I think that such people tended towards materialism. And I, I'd like to draw your attention to this quotation from Engels that I think sums up this, um, this outlook, really, this early materialist outlook, where he says that um, when we consider and reflect upon nature at large or the history of mankind or our own intellectual activity, at first we see the picture of an endless entanglement of relations and reactions in which nothing remains what, where and as it was, but everything moves, changes, comes into being and passes away. This primitive, naive, but intrinsically correct conception of the world is that of ancient Greek philosophy and was first clearly formulated by Heraclitus. Everything is and is not, for everything is fluid, is constantly changing, coming into being and passing away. Now, that, that this conception was essentially, this outlook, this sort of essentially correct, but perhaps um, rather... Uh, sort of um, abstract outlook or uh, was really the outlook of the first ancient Greek philosophers. And as, as I said, it was a materialist outlook. And it's one that I think Marxist philosophers still draw inspiration from today. However, following that, philosophy moved in a strongly idealist direction. You had the most famous philosophers such as Plato um, that were um, very much idealists reacted against this, this early materialism. And there are various reasons for this. Um, and I don't want to denigrate Plato's ideas because he was a brilliant philosopher. But uh, one, I think, reason for this kind of um, idealism, and I think this explains a lot of, as I said, the trend of idealism in history, uh, is um, a, a kind of a prejudice, really, against, um, against work and against... Uh, against the uh, ordinary people. 
for example, um, uh, Plato was um, he, uh, just referring to uh, the world of work and, and people who laboured. He said, it, meaning work, accustoms a man's mind to low ideas and absorbs him in the pursuit of the mere means of life. And his outlook was essentially that um, uh, basically the mind is to the body or the material world as the master is to the slave, you know, the educated person to the uneducated person. And you can see how these people, again, going back to what I said before, that's how they looked at the world as the kind of the material world rather and the world of work as beneath them, essentially. Uh, Whereas those who understood ideas and theories were, of course, higher people and therefore naturally uh, the world of ideas was a higher world that's really essentially was their outlook and throughout the history of philosophy there has also been a uh, a prejudice I think in which matter is seen as um, sort of inert uh, without any animating force and essentially uh, meaningless and merely there for mind to order it if you like so for example Kant who's skipping much further ahead, a much later philosopher, also a, a different kind of idealist, but essentially an idealist, or at least somebody who straddled idealism and materialism. But I would I would say was essentially an idealist. In the critique of judgment, he says the following: the possibility of living matter cannot even be thought. Its concept involves a contradiction, because lifelessness, inertia, constitutes the essential character of matter. And so for most philosophers, it is thought, consciousness that is the driving force that moulds the world, that gives it purpose, shape, form, etc. And uh, shorn of consciousness, the material world is just chaos, meaningless chaos, essentially. That's, that's really the outlook uh, of most philosophers throughout history in one, in one form or another. However, materialism did come back into fashion before Marx and Engels came uh, into being. Um, in the with really with the bourgeois revolution and uh, the enlightenment the scientific revolution and these the philosophers of this era had kind of resuscitated uh, materialism and that, that wasn't an accident they reflected the the um, the revolutionary development of, of bourgeois society and a new class that was confident and believed in science and the ability to explain the world around them and wanted to get rid of the prejudices and dogmas uh, of religion, which obviously had previously dominated uh, what was feudal society. Um, and this was a huge step forward and, and really laid the basis for the ideas of Marx and Engels. And, and they made many brilliant uh, discoveries. Um, however, there was a limitation to this materialism, and it's what we refer to as mechanical materialism. Uh, it was, how do I, would we put it, a kind of passive materialism in which um, it's almost like they went to the opposite extreme in a, in a one-sided manner, whereas the idealist emphasised that mind shapes matter and matter is completely inert. Uh, these materialists tended to go a little bit far in the other direction. They, in their keenness, and fundamentally a correct idea this is, their keenness to, de- to describe the, the fact that humans are moulded by the, mat- the world around them, they're conditioned by society and, and material forces, which of course we agree with. Uh, but in their keenness, they perhaps overstressed that and tended to describe consciousness as completely inert, essentially, and as just, just a sort of passive reflection of the material world. Um, and uh, Marx criticised this in his famous theses on Feuerbach, where he explains that, well, yes, of course, humans are taught or conditioned by the material world and by other people, but then who teaches the people that teach them? Uh, and what Marx is getting at is that, um, is that the, the trouble with this kind of mechanical materialism in which the world was described as in a, in a rather simplistic way in, in which, you know, one force just sort of smashes into another and the inner impulse of, of, the, of the material world is, is not really described. For example, the ideas of Newton, you know, describing very well uh, in, a, in a revolutionary way the laws of, you know, the movement of the planets, for example, in the solar system. This was, of course, a revolutionary development. However, the whole thing was rather simplistic in a sense, uh, a very linear kind of system. 
which ultimately required an external mover to make it to you know to give movement to the system as a whole so once the system once the solar system is is moving then of course uh, it all works perfectly the the laws that he that he discovered perfectly describe how the planets move but why they started moving uh, is inexplicable from this point of view there's no inner impulse if you see what i mean uh, and therefore it required God, essentially. This philosophy required God or some initial mover to set the whole thing in motion. And this really, I think, was the general pro problem of, of this kind of philosophy, this, this, this uh, mechanical materialism. It, it went so far in describing the world, but the science was still at a very limited level, of course. It was a, a new discipline, really. And um, there was only so much that it could describe. And as a result, it tended to fall back into idealist explanations for things. Similarly, if you think about this, this uh, stressing that human thought is uh, conditioned by the material world, but doesn't necessarily condition the world back. In other words, it's very, very passive. Uh, the trouble with that is it assumes that the, the, the human mind actually is, is not part of the material world and is only pushed and pulled by it, but doesn't exert any force back. But of course, uh, a revolutionary Marxist position would explain that, well, actually, humans are part of nature as well. We are only natural beings as well, and we, we inhabit the natural world. So whilst the natural world exerts an enormously powerful uh, influence over our lives, obviously, we have to, as natural beings, we have to f uh, feed ourselves, we have to eat, we have to, to house ourselves, you know, we have to struggle just to survive. This is absolutely, uh, this is the way to, to, to look at humanity. Um, but what flows from that is that we are also part of that material world and in turn can and must change it. And therefore, it's, it's a little one-sided just to say that we are influenced by the world uh, as if we don't change the world ourselves. And indeed, this is the revolution of Marxist philosophy of dialectical materialism because it explains that we change the world and that it's in changing the world that we change ourselves. And that is really the secret to, to human development. Um, so <clears throat> to kind of to, to sum up this introduction to materialism, um, Marx and Engels took materialism further, took it forward by, by showing that really that the material world is an active force and that humanity is also an active force and is not outside of the material world or some sort of spiritual thing, but is part of the material world. Uh, and, and the way in which we, we um, labour and, and you know, put, put our ideas into practice, if you like, or put our desires into practice and change the world defines who we are. Uh, and develops develops society and with it history, and so for the first time in philosophy, a, 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 a realistic picture of humanity and, and of human society was developed by Marx and Engels. Marx describes how, again in the thesis from in, in, on Feuerbach, that humanity or that human nature doesn't exist sort of in an ahistorical character you know, outside of the natural world in each person, like in their soul or something. Human nature is merely the ensemble, as he says, of social relations. It is the product. It doesn't reside in any one person fully, but it's the product of all of humanity interacting with nature and with the rest of humanity in order to survive. And, and in doing so, changing human nature in history. Um, and this, this revolutionary outlook really I think is, 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 the, is the best possible explanation uh, of and the most accurate explanation of, um, of, of, of thought really and the role of thought in the natural world which is how we should see it. Uh, however idealism still exists, uh, religion exists of course but I, not only that but in the realm of philosophy idealism not only still exists but is probably still dominant 20th century philosophy is largely dominated by variants of subjective idealism, which we will discuss in later weeks. Um, and for, for example, postmodernism tends to assert that um, we, that the individual or that humans kind of create truth by the way that they think or talk about things, rather than truth existing independently of us. And that is an idealist position. But why does this still exist? 
why does this, in my opinion, fundamentally unscientific outlook still exist and even dominate? Well, as far as I'm concerned, it's ultimately because of the persistence of class society. It's because we still live in a society characterized by inequality, uh, injustice, and in which humanity doesn't control its own fate or doesn't consciously control its own fate. And therefore we are subject to the... Um, to the forces uh, of, of, of society. And as a result of that, um, everything seems out of our control. Moreover, there are people who are very interested in maintaining the domination uh, of, of the ruling class and therefore want to obscure the real processes of history, the, the realities of class society, the real mechanics of class society. And they would rather us look to our souls uh, or to our values and, and rather, and instead of changing the actual social relations uh, of class society. So ultimately the struggle for materialism is part of the class struggle and it is a revolutionary struggle without which uh, we, will never, um, uh, we will never defeat idealism and never uh, establish materialism as the, as the correct outlook for humanity, which I think it is.